paper. So now Dr. Shriyashi Sarkar will be speaking on role of preoperative anterior segment OCT in identifying intraoperative posterior capsular deficits in PPC. Dr. Shriyashi, please. A very good afternoon to everybody, all my teachers present. So my topic has already been said by sir. So I'm starting. Uh, posterior polar cataract is a congenital cataract with a very low incidence of 3 to 5 per 1,000 cataract patients. And owing to its central position in the visual axis, the vision is affected early. So this is the SINGS classification which we commonly use for PPC cataract. Type 1, 2, 3, and 4. Type 1 is PPC with PAC. Type 2 is with onion ring appearance with gray spots on the edge. Type 3 is with thin or absent PC and type 4, all the three above, with nuclear sclerosis. Uh, these are other two classifications. First one is according to the capsular dehiscence. First one is with imminent PC dehiscence. Second one is with pre-existing PC dehiscence. And third is dislocation of the PPC. Morphologically also we can classify it as bullseye appearance and onion peel appearance. So I did a prospective observational study in Shushrutai Foundation Research Center, Kolkata. And I did ASOCT preoperatively for all the patients to see the posterior capsular status. And I corroborated the findings, intra findings with the pre finding. So I included patients from 25 to 75 years of age having PPC undergoing phaco emulsification and associated with nuclear sclerosis. So I ex excluded patients having pseudo exfoliation, subluxation, phacodonesis, any significant history of ocular trauma, any pre-existing corneal or retinal pathology, and also where I could not image the posterior capsular uh, capsule accurately because of the dense cataract. I st uh, study duration from August 2020 to April 2021. And for results, uh, the ASOCT was done on uh, 44 eyes. And nine eyes had dehiscent PC preoperatively. And 35 eyes had intact. PC. So out of these nine eyes, the seven eyes had intraoperative PCR. Also out of these 35 eyes, 34 eyes had intact PC. The sensitivity of ASOCT for detecting the dehiscence was 94.4%, specificity 87.5%, positive predictive value 97.1% and negative predictive value 77.8%. Diagnostic accuracy was 95.45%. And association between intraoperative PCR and preoperative PC dehiscence was found to be statistically significant using chi-square test. So uh, the three eyes out of 44 where the pre-op ASOCT findings did not corroborate with the intraop findings. So in these three eyes, two eyes who were found to have pre-op dehiscence actually had intact PC. The probable cause can be increased optical density which obscured a clear capsular view on ASOCT giving a false impression of dehiscence and also one eye who had non-dehiscent PC pre-op was found to have PCR. Probable cause may be extremely thin PC or tightly adherent PPC. So, no, no. So these are the ASOCT findings of my patients. The first one we can see a continuity of the posterior capsule. The second one, we can see a discontinuity. We can attribute it to be the dehiscence preoperatively. And this one, the green arrow, uh, this is the, the yellow arrow shows the PSC cataract. So for take home message, we can rely ASO stability as a investigative modality. They can grade the capsule as dehiscent and non-dehiscent preoperatively. So we can divide the cases as high risk and low risk cases. And this can be beneficial to the surgeons for preoperative counseling and also for the patients. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Shreyasi, yes, uh, you are aware of any other methods of diagnosing pre-op like lens star, like the appearance on slit lamp photography itself? Uh, yes, sir, slit lamp, it's not that reliable. Sometimes we can understand the reason, sometimes we cannot. So it was not reliable that much. So lens star, have you come across papers? Well, where? Uh, 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 yeah, I have come across, but I have not applied it in uh, my, any of my patients as such. Just when you, when you give a presentation, at least you should say that these are the other methods, but this is the one that we chose for whatever reason. Okay, and then sir. you can say, compare it perhaps to what is published literature on this. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Thank Sheshi. You,
Now the next speaker is Dr. Manik Sardana, who will be speaking on early detection of glaucoma progression using OCT and geography and comparing it with visual field and RNFL on OCT. And the discussion for this uh, presentation is uh, Dr. L. Vijaya, ma'am. Good evening, everyone. So the title of my uh, thesis was Early Detection of Glaucoma Progression Using Optical Coherence Tomography and Geography and Comparing it with Visual Fields and RNFL Analysis on OCT. Uh, what, what, just, sorry, the timer which went off meant what was three minutes? Three minutes, but the paper was four minutes. Huh, so, uh, so just mention that because we are not keeping time. I'm keeping time. Four minutes, there'll be a double timer or something, no? Yeah. Was it was it according to time the previous paper? So the title of my thesis was Early Detection of Glaucoma Progression Using Optical Coherence Tomography and Geography and Comparing it with Visual Fields and RNFL Analysis on OCT. So glaucoma progression can be computed via functional or structural testing. Functional testing is done with the help of visual fields. Structural testing is done with the help of OCT. And OCT angiography is a new upcoming modality for structural testing. So the objective of our study was to compute glaucoma progression on OCTA and compare it with visual fields and RNFL analysis on OCT. So OCTA is a non-invasive and objective assessment of optic disc vascularization. Vessel density, which is the main parameter in OCTA, is calculated as percentage of area covered by vessels over the total area. And many studies have correlated areas of vessel density decline with areas of nerve fiber layer on OCT. So ours was a prospective non-randomized study. We included 64 eyes of 38 patients. The inclusion criteria was age more than 18 years and we included patients of early to moderate glaucoma. So at first visit, we had two, reli uh, two reliable visual fields, three OCT scans of the nerve fiber layer of the disc and three octa scans of the optic disc. Average was taken for reliability. Same uh, set of scans were repeated in the next follow-up after 9 to 12 months. So how did we analyze progression? On visual fields, glaucoma progression analysis software was used. On OCT, more than 5% decline in the sectoral nerve fiber layer thickness was taken as progression. And on OCT angiography, both quantitative as well as qualitative was taken as progression. Quantitative when more than 5% vessel density decline and qualitative assessment was done by two glaucoma experts, both were blinded. So this is just a representative image showing corresponding defects. We can see a superior nasal notch and corresponding defects on octa, OCT and visual fields. Coming to the results, the mean age was 53.6 years, follow-up duration as already told. Mean vessel density was 37.4% in uh, early glaucoma and 37 in moderate glaucoma. Eight eyes progressed in the early glaucoma group in octa and 15 eyes progressed on a moderate glaucoma group in OCT angiography. The mean vessel density decline on follow-up in octa progressor was minus 4.1. This is just a summary of progression. 14 eyes progressed on visual fields, 18 on OCT and 23 on OCT angiography. This is a Venn diagram showing all the eyes progressing on various methods. Uh, this is uh, comparing progression on octa versus visual fields. So when uh, visual field progression was present, most of the time octa progression was also uh, present. And when it was absent, octa progression was also absent. So both uh, methods agreed statistically and similarly Octa and OCT also agreed statistically while comparing. So to conclude, our data suggests that Octa correlates well with the visual fields and appear to pick up progression earlier than OCT. So Octa offers to be a potential tool for early detection of glaucoma progression in the future. Thank you. Yeah, uh, good presentation. Uh, you said OCTA was uh, assessed by two glaucoma specialists. Yes. What was the agreement between them? <laughs> and both were blinded, so agreement, they both agreed, yes. Yeah, did you, did you check for them? No, no one. Yes. Okay. So both of them were completely blinded, yes. Okay. So both quantitative as well as qualitative assessment was done in us. Yeah, because the reason I asked, because it is evolving technology, it is still has to get refined Yes. to use it like a OCT GPA or visual field GPA. So I'm just curious to know how the two glaucoma specialists fared when they were looking at the 
it's not easy yes yes to exactly come in the same way between the two the people two. okay thank you thank you thank you ma'am thank you uh, dr manik we would like to call the next speaker dr kalini solakpurkar and she'll be speaking on measurement of change in angle kappa and its correlation with ocular biometric parameters pre and post phaco emulsification so ttl sir is not there so dr harsh kumar will be the discussion for this uh, topic uh, good evening one and all sir dr i'm not able to change the slides Uh, so the angular misalignment between the pupillary axis and the visual axis, known as angle kappa, has been uh, implicated to play a role in the centration of multifocal intraocular lenses and in ablation zone centration in laser refractive surgeries. Uh, however, there is a limited available literature on uh, whether angle kappa is a constant entity or changes during cataract surgery. Uh, so our primary objective uh, was to observe this and the secondary objective was to uh, see if there were any factors which are correlating with this change in angle kappa. Uh, also synoptophore uh, being the gold standard for uh, measuring angle kappa, uh, we used this instrument in our study. Uh, this was a prospective observational study done at Shankarai Hospital Bangalore uh, between October 2020 and May 2021. Uh, we included all patients who were planned for elective cataract extraction with monofocal IOL implantation, having a vision of uh, 618 or better. And in case of any ocular pathology or previous history of uh, ocular surgery, or in the event of any intra or post-op complications, uh, they were excluded from the study. Uh, after obtaining informed consent and noting the demographic details, uh, the following parameters were assessed pre-operatively and on day 7 post-operatively. And for angle kappa measurement, we used uh, the uh, synoptophore by Baliwala and Homi. And this was the angle kappa measuring slide. Um, uh, three, uh, under monocular viewing conditions, three consecutive measurements were taken, taken and um, the zero mark would mark the line of sight and the uh, corneal light reflex centered on the pupillary center would mark the pupillary axis. And depending on whether the corneal light reflex was observed nasal or temporal to the center of the pupil, a positive or a negative angle kappa was recorded. Uh, so the uh, minimum sample size was calculated to be 50 eyes and the statistical analysis was done using descriptive statistics using Pearson's correlation coefficient and the student's PET T test was used to calculate significance and a P less than 0 0.05 was considered significant. Uh, we observed 54 eyes of 42 patients having a mean age of 63 years. Uh, these were the main preoperative ocular biometric parameters and uh, a significant change in angle kappa was noted following cataract surgery. This change ranged from uh, no change to up to 5 degrees postoperatively and the majority of the patients had up to 1 degree uh, change uh, postoperatively. And a statistically significant negative correlation was noted between corneal white to white diameter and the change in angle kappa. Uh, so this is a low S curve showing the inverse correlation between change in angle kappa and corneal white to white measurement. And uh, uh, to summarize, uh, a significant change in angle kappa was noted in our study post phaco emulsification. And for every 1 mm increment in corneal white to white diameter, there was a minus 2.42 scale reduction in angle kappa. And the prediction of the change in angle kappa could be done based on the corneal white to white measurement. Uh, the merits of our study was that synoptophore, which is the gold standard, was used in our study. And the drawbacks were that very long and very short eyes were not included. And a larger sample size would uh, help us analyze the change in angle kappa better. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Dr. Harsh Kumar. Tick, tick. Um, Again, uh, your how how sensitive was your test that you could uh, accurately predict one degree or two degrees? Uh, sir, the uh, angle kappa measuring slide has letters and alphabets which are separated at a, a separation of one degree. And because synoptophore is still a subjective observation, we ensured that a single observer was uh, observing 
uh, the patients pre and post operatively and also the interpupillary distance which was measured on the synoptophore is again subjective so the ipd which was measured for a patient pre operatively the same ipd was maintained uh, by the same observer post operatively also no you see what happens is as you correctly said synoptophore is is a subjective measurement and it's it's dependent on the observer at that time to see whether you know it could be the same observer but that same observer could be subject to errors of a degree or more when he's when he's uh, yeah so that's yes, a little sir. drawback also of this study yeah. yes sir thank you thank you so much we would like to call the next speaker now sabia handa and she'll be speaking on submacular hemorrhage displacement using subretinal rtpa and air versus subretinal balance salt solution and air a comparative study and dr rajiv reddy will be the discussant for this term a very good evening to everyone so excuse uh, me one minute yes sir yes ma'am this is mch thesis no we are this is Thank you. Okay. So, what is the final decision? Okay. No, ma'am. <laughs> Thank you for letting me present. So, uh, submacular hemorrhage can occur secondary to wet AR MD, PCV, myopic CNV, or uh, retinal artery macronism. And the natural history and the visual outcome of these hemorrhages are typically poor. So, early displacement of these hemorrhages from macular area is recommended to restore useful vision. And various techniques have been described in the literature for the management of these large uh, submacular hemorrhages, ranging from surgical evacuation, intravitreal gas with or without TPA, to PPV with subretinal TPA injection. However, currently there is no consensus or treatment guidelines regarding the optimal management of large submacular hemorrhages. So this study was designed with an aim to study the role of subretinal balanced salt solution as a substitute to TPA in the management of these hemorrhages. TPA, as we know, is expensive and is not freely available. And for the purpose of study, the fundus was divided into these four zones. So coming to the primary objective, which was to see the displacement of hemorrhage from baseline at one month. And to the secondary objective was to see the uh, change in BCVA from baseline within each group and between two groups at three months. And for the purpose of study, the eyes were divided into two groups. The outcome was assessed in terms of complete success, partial success or failure in which when the hemorrhage uh, displaced from both zone 1 as well as zone 2, it was termed as complete success. So the following was the inclusion criteria, only the large submacular hemorrhages of less than 2 weeks duration were included. So this was an ambispective non-randomized interventional study in which the eyes were divided into two groups. Group A patients underwent uh, PPV with induction of PVD, followed by injection of TPA and 0.2 ml of air, followed by partial FAX, 20% SF6 tamponade and heads up positioning. In group B, the entire procedure remained the same, except that instead of TPA, subretinal BSS was used. And this is a small video uh, demonstrating the steps of surgery. Following the fasting of vitrectomy, a subretinal cannula is used a mixture of either TPA and air or BSS and air into the subretinal space. And the, this is followed by a partial fluid exchange and SF6 tamper. So coming to the results, 10 eyes were included in group A and 11 in group B. And we can see that the most common cause of hemorrhage was the PCV in both the groups. And coming to the primary objective, 9 out of 10 eyes in TPA group and 9 out of 11 eyes in the BSS group showed complete displacement from zone 1 as well as zone 2. And as far as, far as secondary objective was concerned, there was a significant improvement in visual acuity in both the groups. And the visual acuity gain in both the groups was comparable. So coming to the case example from group A. This was a female with the wet ARMD. We can see that there was displacement of submacular hemorrhage. However, the visual acuity remained guarded due to the subfovial scar. And this is a case example of a patient from the BSS group. 
we can see here that the sub, uh, macular hemorrhage has been uh, displaced and the visual acuity gain uh, has improved from hand motion to 618. So to conclude, PPV with, uh, with injection of subretinal BSS and air is effective in displacing large submacular bleeds who, uh, in patients presenting within two weeks of symptoms and is comparable to T, uh, TPA. However, certain limitations are that this is an ambispective, it's not a prospective study, it's not, it's a non-randomized study with a small sample size and toxicity of either BSNs and TPA could not be assessed in the study. Uh, I would like to thank my mentors, especially Dr. Mohit and Dr. Ramandeep Singh for helping me carrying out this thesis. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Rajiv Reddy. Sir, in, uh, for TPA, we have seen that in patients who have undergone subretinal TPA injection, in higher doses, there can be some autofluorescence changes and damage to RP and photoreceptors. These changes appear as hypo-autofluorescence on, uh, on autofluorescence imaging. Sir, that was one of the limitations. We could not do autofluorescence pre and post for all the patients. I mentioned in one of my limitations. So, what about uh, sub-retinal and sub-RP hemorrhages? Sir, so in these patients, even the patients with sub-RP hemorrhage were included, but that cannot be displaced. Uh, that we, we didn't uh, carry, out, carry out this study for sub-RP hemorrhage, only for sub-macular sub, uh, hemorrhage. Because I saw a patient where saw sub-RP hemorrhage is more Yes, of... sir, that we cannot displace anywhere. But the patients were included in both the groups. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So, we'd like to call the next speaker, Dr. Abhinia Viliapan, and she'll be speaking on the effect of Oralab aqueous drainage device implantation and trap on corneal endothelium and anterior chamber inflammation, a prospective randomized open label blinded endpoint study. And Dr. Sushmita Kaushik will be the discussant for this presentation. I'm the co-guide for this thesis. Oh. <laughs> let, let Dr. Harsh do it. Ha, 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 ha. No, 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 you are the judge. Unbiased. Can I start? Please start now. Yes. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I would like to talk on my dissertation, which was on the effect of oral lab aqueous drainage device implantation and trabeculectomy on corneal endothelium and anterior chamber flare, which was a probe study. So as we all know, nowadays glaucoma shunts are also preferred as primary surgical procedure and are these gaining popularity because of its affordability, comparable IOP reduction with uh, BGI and uh, Ahmed glaucoma valve and indigenous manufacturing. But the lacunae literature lies on the corneal endothelium focusing and uh, anterior chamber inflammation. Uh, so hence the objectives of my study were to evaluate the change in corneal endothelial cell density and fluctuations in AC flare in uh, trabeculectomy and RD in comparison between the two with secondary objectives of any glaucoma surgery that is the IOP reduction and complications. Uh, this was conducted for a period of one year at uh, Glaucoma Clinic Advanced Eye Center and salient exclusion criteria included complicated uh, cataract surgery, corneal endothelial disorders, glau secondary glaucoma and uh, retinal disorders. Once the patients were randomized into the two groups, five visits were taken, pre-operative, post-op day one, one week, one month and three months. Uh, important points to note is that the specular non-contact microscopy was done in five quadrants in all the patients and uh, in the RD group, all the uh, patients tube was placed in the supratemporal quadrant. The outcomes in the IOP were classified based on complete qualified and failure based on uh, reduction of IOP with or without use of anti-glaucoma medication. Coming to the results, 21 subjects in each group of comparable baseline characteristics were included in the study and the effects on corneal endothelium were taken into these three criteria. The mean corneal endothelial density values as you can see in the table between the two groups and the vertical line showing between pre-op to post-op day three months and the yellow ones high highlighted show the significant values which showed changes from the baseline. So between the two groups at the end of three months there was no statistical significance between uh, in the mean corneal endothelial cell density. Coming to the main percentage of hexagonality values the Adi group had significant hexagonality loss in the supratemporal quadrant where the tube was placed at post-op day one, day one month and uh, three months. 
coming to the mean coefficient of variation though there were a significant changes in the coefficient of variation till one month in rd group by the end of three months it had normalized and uh, both the group showed no statistical significance as compared to baseline the ac flare values were persistently high in all post-op visits as compared to the baseline in both the groups uh, but the mean rise in flare were mo was more in the trabeculectomy group at post-op day one month and three months the mean IOP was uh, successfully reduced in all the post-operative visits in both the groups, uh, but the need for uh, anti-glaucoma medication was more in the RD group at the end of first week due to hypertensive phase and uh, at three months due, uh, in trabeculectomy group. Uh, coming to the ASOCT, the tube corneal endothelial distance between... Uh, Sorry, the tube corneal endothelial distance was uh, correlating with the supratemporal corneal endothelial cell density value readings only at the first week in the RD group. Early and late complications between the two groups were comparable, uh, though the need for uh, secondary procedures was significantly more in the trabeculectomy group as compared to the RD group. Correlation studies were performed where age of the subject and tube corneal endothelial distance were found to significantly associate with the CECD value till one week in the RD group, whereas no such correlations were found in the trabeculectomy group. These findings were concurrent with available literature in terms of AGV and BG uh, in the corneal endothelium aspect and the IOP reduction in RD which has been performed previous studies. Uh, one salient point in our study was that of three patients due to choroidals were on a short course of steroids which might have caused a transient decrease in the AC flare and might have affected the flare comparison between the two groups. Coming to the conclusions, there was no significant variation in the CECD loss, IOP reduction and flare between the two groups apart from the persistent hexagonality loss in the superior temporal quadrant in the RD group where the tube was placed. RD can be safely considered as a primary option. These are the merits and demerits of my study. I would like to acknowledge my mentors and AIO's ARC team for giving me this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Bede. Excellent presentation. Thank you so much. And well in time. I think you're the first one well in time. Thank you, and uh, just I'm a little confused. Uh, why, Ari, why do you think there is an option in India to f do a valve as a primary procedure? Sir, no, sir. Uh, I mean, well, not the comparison has been done thinking what? Uh, because normally you could have compared with another valve or something, maybe that sir, would have such been. And were all the surgeries done by one surgeon? No, sir, that is a limitation of our study with three surgeons who uh, were performing the surgeries. There were no, three glaucoma surgeries. Just tell me the thought performed. process about, because to the best of my knowledge, we do uh, valves when traps are, are failing. Yeah. Yes, sir. So, uh, there are a few studies and I mean, there are a few uh, editorials which do say that uh, we uh, between, uh, when there is a question between trap and uh, Because one of the surgeries, things you said can... was that it is uh, less expensive uh, than, as the other available than the trams. available thing. Yes, sir. And then so you are comparing with TRAB, which is free. Yes, sir. But, sir, but uh, <laughs> I would like to say this is, uh, we have taken TRAB because uh, that is the goal, like uh, the first gold standard surgery which we do for uh, filtration aspect. But uh, since uh, TRAB versus tube study has been done, similar studies have been done with other valves, we wanted to have a take on it with the indigenous uh, valves. So. That, okay. is, that was one of the ideas which we had when we had to take up Can the topic for please, the please. dissertation. Very excellent presentation. Thank you so yeah, much. A good presentation, you, but I have one major question. Yes. You, if you want to really know what happens to the endothelium, do you think three months is enough? No, no, ma'am. That is one other limitation of my study yeah. in the longer follow-up is needed. Okay. And uh, all the... Adi were primary? primary All the Adi were primary. Never had any no, surgery before? We had excluded, ma'am. Okay. The third question yes, was the length of the tube yes, inserted was measured and it was yes, the same in all patients? Yes, ma'am. It okay. was meant, uh, okay. measured to be 2.4 mm from the limbus. Okay. And entry. Thank you. Thank Good you. work. Don't worry, we'll catch the other people <laughs> who have given the topic. <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank you very you, much. Sir. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker is Dr. Shalin Shah. And he will be speaking on alterations in retrobulbar hemodynamics following orbital decompression surgery in thyroid eye disease. And I'd li like to request Dr. L. Vijaya, ma'am, to be the discussant. Thank you, sir. Dr. Kurish Maskati will be the discussant for this. Yes, yeah, so good evening. Um, 
I'll be discussing about uh, thyroid eye disease, uh, orbital perfusion changes. So as we all know the Rundle's curve, there is an active phase which is the dynamic phase, the inflammation increases and consequently the orbital perfusion increases for initial 12 to 18 months followed by an inactive phase when the inflammation decreases and the orbital perfusion has also been described in the literature to decrease beyond the normal orbits. So the orbital perfusion we measured using color Doppler imaging in central retinal artery that's CRA and ophthalmic artery OA. Here the peak systolic velocity shown with the red arrow and uh, the end diastolic velocity shown with the blue arrow were measured and the Doppler waveform is shown and the resistivity index was calculated as per the formula shown. Now the literature does not uh, accurately describe the effect of orbital decompression on arterial perfusion parameters in thyroid eye disease patients. So we conducted this surgery, we conducted this uh, thesis and uh, we included moderate to severe inactive non-smoker adult patients. Any disease which could affect the orbital perfusion systemic disease were excluded. We had three groups, group A which underwent orbital decompression surgery after a euthyroid phase where a lateral wall and fat decompression was done. Group B we had moderate to severe patients who were observed for three months and group C there were 18 healthy controls with refractive errors who were analyzed. So our uh, demography and baseline parameters match the epidemiology for thyroid eye disease described in the literature. Now these are our pre-op and post-op photos where we can see post decompression the proptosis has decreased and coming to the Doppler parameters so our proptosis intraocular pressure significantly decreased now the peak systolic velocity and end diastolic velocity in both CRA and ophthalmic artery they increased significantly whereas the resistivity index decreased significantly in both the arteries studied so these are our Doppler images uh, patient 1 and patient 2 and we can see the Doppler waveforms in each pre-op and post-op how it has significantly improved post decompression surgery at three months. The group B which was observed for three months TD orbits they showed no significant changes in Doppler flow and the group C which were healthy controls when they were compared with thyroid eye disease the diseased orbits had reduced velocities and increased resistivity index. And all the Doppler parameters showed a strong correlation with duration of thyroid disorder, that is duration of Graves' disease. We also did an area under curve analysis and we compared the healthy with thyroid orbits and we found that ophthalmic artery peak systolic velocity had the maximum discriminatory power and we established some cutoffs. We also used it to distinguish between mild and moderate to severe thyroid eye disease patients. The mild patients were the patients in group B. So, and we found that ophthalmic artery EDV was uh, the, had the maximum discriminatory power. So the Doppler placement of the gates have been shown in this uh, anatomical picture and lesions which are proximal to the Doppler placement gate will affect the peak systolic velocity whereas the distal lesions will affect the end diastolic velocity. So the site of uh, vascular resistance could be the orbital apex, it could be the fibrosed muscles, it could be the fibrosed adipose tissue in the orbit or it could be the intraocular microvasculature. So from our study, we proposed that the resolution of orbital space volume conflict following decompression surgery would improve the arterial perfusion and this could in turn reduce the occurrence of ischemic dysthyroid optic neuropathy. Intraocular microvascular changes have been described in literature but we did not study in our uh, protocol. So we could not correlate OCTA findings, we could not see the venous changes and the posterior ciliary artery changes, small sample size, short follow up and no randomization. So serial monitoring of color Doppler parameters could be helpful in predicting TED progression and it could be a determinant for early orbital decompression surgeries which are under which have underperfused orbits. Thank you. Uh, you see are you making out a case that every thyroid eye disease patient who's got proptosis needs a decompression so as because every one of your patients who had a decompression improved their perfusion uh, and reduced their ocelot index? Yes, sir. So are you making out a case for an aggressive decompression for every... Sir, uh, what I would like to point out is that we found uh, a discriminatory cutoff uh, during our study between the mild to moderate to severe and between healthy and thyroid eye disease orbits. So whenever uh, our suggestion is whenever the velocity values are be below the cutoff, there is an increased risk for orbital ischemia and ischemic optic neuropathy. And uh, so decompression may help, but we would like to have a larger 
uh, sample size and a longer follow up and you would like to correlate with the intraocular changes whether actual ONH vascularity is altering after decompression or not which we could not do as a part of our study. See because the, the we have a large volume of thyroid eye disease patients Yes, sir. and the numbers of thyroid eye disease patients who develop an optic nerve head perfusion issue is very low. It's so very in spite of no decompressions being done in practical life, they, I mean, I, I agree with what you're saying that no one has done these type of studies, but what you're, what you're showing is fairly logical, but it doesn't lead to a conclusion that you should do a decompression because even if you leave them alone, I'm not sure what your cutoff, it's an arbitrary cutoff that you have chosen. No, sir. We got it from the area under curve analysis and Uden's ratio that whatever had the maximum sensitivity and specificity without, you know, okay. going for aggressive decompression in well so, perfused orbits. And sir, the concept of this thesis came up from there are a, there are a lot of studies uh, which are uh, suggesting that even uh, patients with Graves' disease and without features of TED have uh, optic nerve head perfusion changes. And if we could identify these patients early. It could be a reversible process, but beyond four, five years when the fibrosis of all the orbital fat and muscles has set in, then it becomes an irreversible process. So, okay. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, we would like to go on to the next presentation by Dr. Shweta Sandhu. Dr. Shweta is here. Okay. So, Dr. Mohammad Sabir. So judges, please note, Dr. Shweta is not there. Dr. Mohammad Sabir is not there. Dr. Nitya Raghu. Dr. Nitya Raghu will be speaking on study of psychological variables in glaucoma patients affecting treatment compliance and disease progression. And Dr. Harsh Kumar will be the discussant for this. Originally, I am a lot to Originally, I am going to Anyway, ठीक है तो आप कीजिए आप कीजिए आपका लीजिए डॉक्टर डॉक्टर तनुज दादा विल भी हाँ she's feeling scared now don't don't worry yes sir पहले worry कर दिए उसके बाद वाले don't worry good evening everyone the reason for choosing this topic was to understand the psychological impact and adaptation of a patient to their disease, in this case glaucoma. So we took up two psychological variables for the patients, coping mechanism and perceived social support. Coping can be divided broadly into two categories, problem-based and emotion-based coping. And most studies have shown that problem-based coping is more healthy and positive. Social support can be via friends, family, significant others. And according to studies done in other diseases like COPD and hypertension, patients who have a higher social support score do well emotionally with a better emotional well-being and are more adherent to a healthy lifestyle. In our study, we have taken patients who had known cases of glaucoma for at least one year, who are currently on anti-glaucoma medications and had a previous year's documented visual field report with us. We asked them to fill out three questionnaires, the brief cope questionnaire for coping mechanism, multidimensional skill for perceived social support and modest key medication adherence scale. The visual fields were checked at that visit and they were followed up for one year to do a repeat field examination. Uh, a field test done one year prior to enrollment was also taken into account, so we got an adequate time to check for progression of disease. Progression of glaucoma was taken according to the AMGT trial as a minimum of three significantly progressing points in pattern standard deviation in minimum of three consecutive visual field examinations. In our results, we had 113 patients who were enrolled, 22% of them had a family history of glaucoma and 34% had a glaucoma surgery done in the past. We divided them into four categories depending on the duration of disease, that's 1 to 2, 3 to 5 years, 6 to 8 years and more than 8 years. The predominant coping mechanism among our marked patients, 86.7% had problem-oriented coping. However, patients who had a glaucoma surgery in the past and are still being maintained on medications had a higher score for emotion-oriented coping compared to the rest of our patients. And coming to social support system, the predominant social support was family in our patients, but patients who had a family history of glaucoma gave a higher mean score for friends as social support system. Further, adherence to medications, 38.1% of our patients had a high adherence, but 34.5% had a low adherence, which is very scary. 
uh, but look, a significant finding here was the three to five years category had the minimum adherence to their medications and correspondingly the maximum patients who progressed glaucoma had again the same category of three to five years post diagnosis. So to understand these findings we did discuss with our clinical psychologist and the reason for having emotion based coping high post surgery it could be that when given the option of surgery they're initially hopeful that they won't have to use AGMs after this. When this doesn't happen they adapt differently. Patients have a family history of glaucoma. Uh, it was said by Glenn F.C. et al. that though social support is a vital tool, patients have a feeling of anxiety and a sense of burden on the patient, person they are depending on for help. So this could be a reason patients with family history are hesitant to rely on family who is already burdened with the disease. And coming to the duration of glaucoma affecting adherence and progression, this has not been researched in any other study till date. But it, it's possible that between three to five years, the initial anxiety of the disease starts waning off, that boredom and of taking the routine medications are setting in, and this could be the reason of the compliance dropping. After six years, it's possible that they have noticed visual field changes themselves, or it has been stressed upon by that physician, and then we see a gradual increase in compliance with the duration of disease. Uh, so limitations of our study, we did not have a glaucoma progression analysis available for us. We could have overestimated progression. And another significant one was we had to rely on the patient's honest replies and questionnaires might not always have been reliable. In conclusion, though we did not find a direct correlation between coping mechanism and progression of glaucoma, we do say it is important to focus on psychological aspects of patient care to give a more holistic approach. And according to our study, red flag signs in glaucoma patients for both emotional and ophthalmic health are history of glaucoma surgery, living for the disease for three to five years, and those with the family history of glaucoma. Thank you. I'd like to thank my mentors, uh, Meena Ma'am and Kaushik sir, for helping me carry this out. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Nita. It was wonderfully done. I wish I could speak like that. Thank you, sir. Uh, just uh, one or two things, uh, especially if you send your paper. I am wondering that you have uh, clubbed the psychological factors with disease progression. Yes, sir. Now the disease progression is maybe related to so many other factors, yes, which sir. here you have not uh, done. True, sir. So this really, especially when you send it for publication, please uh, don't. Yes, sir, add that on because, uh, and like you rightly yourself said, the limitation is adherence. Yes, uh, that should have been a big thing. Either you should have given bottles to them and then called them back. Yes, or something sir, we have to like rely that. on them honestly giving a reply whether they have put yeah, it or but not. Could you put it over there? Yes, Excellent, sir. thank you. Sir. One minute, hold on. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I congratulate you. Very innovative topic, but uh, two important factors you must take into account one is the per capita income and the literacy of the patient. Yes, so sir. that has important bearing on the adherence yeah, to medication. Yes, a socioeconomic status is another important limitation yeah. we have that was not taken into account for us. It's a limitation. Well done, well done. Thank well you, sir. Uh, so, ma'am, ma'am, we had three. One was for coping, a social support, and one was for. Ad it is it is uh, internationally used, ma'am, but we had to translate it to Kannada and Hindi. So we did that according to uh, guidelines given by Sang et al. We had two people independently translate and then back translate by a third person. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, we'll go on to the next presentation, which is by Dr. Barkha Gupta. Dr. Barkha Gupta is here. So judges, please note, Dr. Barkha Gupta is not here. Dr. Shashi Prakash. Dr. Shashi Prakash is not here. Dr. Maitri Krish Krishnamurti Rao. Dr. Maitri will be speaking on Stuttgart's disease, correlation between genotype and phenotype in Indian population. And, and the discussant is Dr. Girish. Strong? Oh, okay, okay, okay. Dr. Rajiv, please. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my thesis was on Stargard disease, correlation between genotype and phenotype in Indian population. Uh, it's a juvenile onset uh, macular dystrophy with a prevalence of 1 in 10,000. And these are few of the genes associated with central retinal dystrophies. There exists wide clinical and genetic heterogeneity of Stargard disease. Lacking in literature is that only few studies have given the genotype-phenotype correlation for an Indian Stargard disease cohort. The objective of the study was to provide genotype-phenotype correlation that would help in precise molecular diagnosis and prognostication and to determine the utility of ancillary investigations. 
Uh, it was a retrospective prospective hospital-based observation study that included 25 patients who were clinically suspected to have Stargardt disease and had undergone gene testing. Uh, we collected the demographic data and family history. BCVA was recorded. Comprehensive ocular examination was followed by investigations like color fundus photo, optical coherence tomography, full field ERG, fundus autofluorescence, and the results of gene testing were utilized for genotype phenotype correlation. The patients with ABCA4 gene mutation were divided into three Fishman phenotypes based on the fundus features. Fishman phenotype one had an atrophic foveal lesion with surrounding perifoveal flex. Two had atrophic foveal lesion with numerous flex and three had multiple areas of atrophy extending beyond the arcade. Fundus autofluorescence characters uh, uh, were divided into three types where type 1 had hypoautofluorescence uh, with a homogeneous background, type 2 had hypoautofluorescence with heterogeneous background and type 3 had multiple areas of hypoautofluorescence with a heterogeneous background. ERG response was divided into type 1 to type 4 where type 1 had normal response, type 2 had reduced photopic type 3 had reduced scotopic and photopic and reduced uh, scotopic was type 4. We had three categories of ABCA4 gene mutation. Category 1 patients had two or more reported variants. Category 2 had one novel variant with one or more reported variants and category 3 had two novel variants. Coming to the results, in our male predominant cohort, the median age at onset was 13 years, the, the median disease duration was 5 years, the mean BCA, BCV was 0.78 logma, uh, the median central foveal thickness was 40 microns, the mean uh, subfoveal choroidal thickness was 288.9 microns. 84% of our patients had ABCA4 gene mutation and there were one patient each who had CNGB3 mutation PROM1. PDE6A and TULP1 mutation and there was one patient who had no mutation but he was clinically suspected to have Stargardt disease. Correlation analysis revealed that BCVA and subfoveal choroidal thickness declined with the disease duration. Uh, patients with ABCA4 mutation with background flex extending outside the arcade showed a significantly thinner SFCT and poorer BCVA and they also had predominantly type 3 ERG response. Among the two predominant categories of ABCA4 gene mutation, patients who belong to category 1 had a significantly thinner foveal thickness and a longer disease duration. And 36% of these patients had the flex extending outside the arcade. They also showed predominantly type 3 ERG response, while more than half the patients in category 2 showed a normal ERG response. We also compared the phenotype between patients having ABCA4 gene mutation and other mutation, but we did not find any significant difference between the two groups. Uh, so the limitations of our study was it was a retro-prospective study, it was a cross-sectional study and hence the natural history of the disease could not be commented upon. The sample size was small and there was unequal distribution of patients among the different categories. To conclude, majority of the patients had ABCA4 mutation and did not differ significantly when compared to patients with other mutations and the novel mutations that we identified in our cohort had a milder phenotype compared to those reported earlier. Patients with background flex extending outside the arcade had a significantly lower SFCT, poorer BCV and predominantly type 3 ERG response. Uh, STOCD, fundus autofluorescence and ERG can help in the clinical staging and help in the prognostication which aid in the patient counseling. Thank you. Dr. Rajiv Reddy. Good, uh, good study. So did you do an autofluorescence in two different machines or one uh, machine? Yes sir, we had Cirrus and uh, Spectralis. Autofluorescence? Yes sir. So what about optos you mentioned somewhere? Uh, yeah, optos also, yes. We had that also. So three, three different machines. Three different machines. How did you yes. decide which one to award? Uh, so it was left to the clinician's discretion. Sir. So is there any difference between the machines when you're doing an autofluorescence in this? Nothing. No difference? No difference. Okay. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Maitri. We'll move on to the next presentation. Dr. Apurva is it? Dr. Apurva Agarwal will be speaking on study of efficacy of cross-linking in thin cornea using donial corneal microkeratome assisted lenticule. And the uh, discussant will be Dr. Praveen Krishna and Dr. Girish. Good, good evening, everyone. Aim of my study was to study the efficacy of collagen cross-linking in arresting progression using donor corneal lenticule in keratoconus patients with thin corneas. Obje primary objective of the study was to assess the stabilization effect by measuring the difference in the pre-operative and post-operative keratometry values and secondary objective was to assess the safety by measuring the endothelial cell count pre- and post-operatively. Study was done in Shafai Center, Delhi. It's a pros prospective interventional cohort study. 24 eyes of 18 patients with keratoconus were enrolled. Inclusion criteria includes age between 18 to 40 years, 
pachymetry at the apex between the 360 to 400 microns after removing the epithelium and after riboflavin drops. Patient with third, second or third stage of keratoconus according to the ancillary chromic classification and a healthy corneal endothelium. Exclusion criteria was any history of viral corneal infections, past ocular surgeries, gut data, scars, autoimmune conditions, pregnancy and nursing women. Pre-operative assessment after doing the routine eye examination, corneal tomography, anterior segment OCT and specular microscopy was done in all the patients. Uh, surgical planning include therapeutic grade corneal tissue was taken from eye bank already screened for viral markers. Lenticule is prepared using MADS microkeratone. Intended lenticule thickness was around 120 to 180 microns. Isotonic riboflavin with 0.1% and 1% HPMC was used. Tissue prepared was trephined using 8 millimeter uh, corneal trephine and intraoperative pachymetry was done at various points in the donor cornea, thickness of the donor cornea after removing epithelium and the lenticule thickness. In the patient's cornea, uh, after removing the epithelium at the corneal apex, after putting the riboflavin drops for 20 minutes and after placing the lenticule over the patient's cornea. This is a short video showing the preparation of the lenticule. So, uh, using a 350 micron head with a free cap setting, lenticule is prepared and the intraoperative pachymetry of the lenticule is done. After doing the trephination, the lenticule is kept in a teflon block and soaked in the riboflavin and then it is put over the co patient's cornea and uh, UV exposure was given for 30 minutes. There are various factors to know how do microslinking is working or not. At six months follow-up, in terms of results, flattening and regularization of the tangential map is noted. Also, there was a minimum SIP cl clinical haze on densitometry map. Uh, minimal clinical haze can be seen on the slit lamp photos of the patient and demarcation line was seen in more than 80% of the patients. K1, K2 and Kmax value was significant at six months follow-up. P-value is less than 0.001%. Significant improvement is seen in sphere, cylinder, and mean refractive spherical equivalent. Uncorrected uh, distance visual equity and corrected distance visual equity does not show a very significant change at one month, but at six months follow-up, there was a significant change. There are various other techniques techniques available with the various drawbacks associated with them. Advantage of our technique is stroma allow better penetration of riboflavin, constructive use of therapeutic grade corneas, screening of for the viral markers already done so it doesn't have to convince a refractive surgery patient to do the same and it also help in expanding the number of cases where C3I can be done. Limitation is we can't customize the extract thickness of the lenticule as we can do with the smile lenticule. Conclusion, cross-linking in thin corneas is an evolving science. Corneal lenticule may be used and early data suggests it's effective and safe, but further studies and refinement of technique are necessary. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Praveen. Dr. Girish, do you want to go first? So, thanks, uh, Dr. Apurva. That's a well-meaning study. So, uh, interesting concept as well. And you know that uh, there are alternatives to what you have studied here as well. Yes, sir. For example, using a contact, contact lens, lens assisted and a smile using, lenticule. Or using hypoosmolar yes, riboflavin in the same group. Yes, sir. So how would you think that your results would compare with what is already published? Yes, sir. Using a contact lens versus or a hypoosmolar riboflavin. So in contact lens associated uh, cross-linking, there were various papers which says that at the uh, it is not a original corneal tissue, so the penetration is not as good as the normal uh, stroma. Also, uh, there can be sometimes intraoperative buckling of the contact lens which can happen, which can lead to the hot and the cold areas. So that can lead to ineffective or less effective cross-linking. Same, uh, and in the cases of hypoosmolar riboflavin, so there can be a poor shielding effect which can be there. Uh, other thing is because collagen is uh, less and we are increasing the thickness of the cornea by use of hypoosmolar agents, the cross-linking effect is not very effective. So also the subgroup of patients that you chose, yes. 360 to 400, Yes, sir. they are potentially the same subgroup that can be cross-linked using hypoosmolar. Do you think you would have a better efficacy shown if you had taken patients who are completely out of the other groups of potential cross-linking like less than 360 microns? Could have been possible, sir. But uh, when we were uh, choosing the patients, we have uh, chosen the patients on the basis of the uh, Pentacam report pre-operatively. So in that, if corneal thickness is less than 400 microns, so we have taken thickness around 320 to 400 microns. Inclusion criteria includes the thickness of 360 to 400 after removing the epithelium at the apex and after putting the riboflavin drops. So before putting the riboflavin, and we have used isotonic riboflavin. So before putting the riboflavin drops, the thickness of cornea was less as 
compared to the if we have used in a hypersmolar riboflavin sir thank you thank you sir thank you at the end of this session i'd like to give the certificates to all the participants and, um, and it will be guide wise so i would like to call dr shriyasi sarkar and i would like to request dr kuresh maskati sir to please come in the front to give the certificate you want the photo sir if you can come on the top I would like to call Dr. Manik Sardana, and I would like to request Dr. L. Vijay Ma'am to please give the certificate. I'd like to doctor, uh, call Dr. Kelini Salapurkar, and I'd like to request Dr. Harsh Kumar Sir to please give this. I'd like to call Dr. Abinia, Abinaya, and I'd like to request Dr. Sushmita Kaushik, ma'am, to please give the certificate. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Shalin Shah, and I'd like to request Dr. Tanuj Dada to please give the certificate. Dr. Nitya Raghu, I'd like to request Dr. Girish to please give the certificate to her. <laughs> Dr. Maitri, and I'd like to request Dr. Rajiv Reddy, sir, to please give the certificate. And I'd like to request Dr. Apurva Agarwal to please come. And I'd like to request Dr. Praveen, sir, to please give the certificate to Dr. Apurva. <laughs> sir, you Dr. Sabia ko bhi de de na certificate. Huh? Dr. Sabia ko. Can I request Dr. L. Vijay Ma'am to please give the certificate? <laughs> Dr. Sabia, please. Thank you. Can we have all the participants and the judges for a picture, please, on the stage? So what about certificates for judiciary? <laughs> <laughs> Can you please all come up, please? Vijay, ma'am, up uh, on the stage. All the participants on the stage, please. Uh -huh. <laughs> Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you so much, everybody. The Academic and Research Committee is really grateful to all the judges and the participants for making this program a huge success. Thank you very much, and uh, have a wonderful evening with the Bollywood night tonight. <laughs>